Okay, so we'll talk about MR the elbow. Uh, we don't really need to go through the technical aspects of, of the pulse sequences. We, we see those every day. So uh, this is a patient who came with, with lateral uh, pain. What are some of the issues we have? Uh, Michael, what do you think about this patient? This is real lateral epicondylitis. Um, I see. Um, you know, fat sat T2. I see increased signal on the kind of hum uh, the radial head as well as the lateral. Okay, so you see increased signal through here. Yeah, and I'm not sure if that's real because um, it does look like there's probably some artifact in this examination. And there's also some increased signal on the lateral uh, condyle and epicondyle as well. Okay, so what would you do if you saw this? Um, well, this is fat sat T2. I guess if there's a stir image, I'd like to compare to. There's a stir. Uh, so, yeah, so there's no, so there's no signal on the stir, so that's just like incomplete fat saturation. Yeah, so so this is uh, due to magnetic field and 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 homogeneity. There's actually suppression of the water signal here, and you have you you have lack of suppression of the fat signal in those areas, all due to because of magnetic field and homogeneity. From the coil, and notice uh, sometimes people just try to read through these, but notice that here is a tear that we'll talk about of the origin of the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon here, uh, which was a cause of this patient's symptoms, and it was there here, but you can't see it because of all the artifact. So, uh, as you say, you, if you see this kind of situation, especially if it's an area where you're suspecting the pathology, you have to uh, do additional sequences to get rid of the artifact. So that was inadvertent water set. Okay, uh, Jennifer, here's an arthrogram. I mean, uh, never mind. Uh, this just shows an arthrogram. Uh, we rarely do arthrography the elbow, and as you know, in my experience would really do arthrography just about anywhere if it were up to me. Uh, but occasionally we'll do MR arthrograms of the elbow. Uh, maybe you can see the articular cartilage a little bit better, but one of the problems here is that. Uh, if you have, as we've talked about in all the other joints, if the contrast is too concentrated, then the T2-weighted images aren't, aren't very useful. And we can just see the, the arthrogram. Uh, so, Jennifer, this patient came in with uh, elbow pain, uh, laterally, uh, lateral elbow pain. Uh, what do you think is going on here? Um, so it looks like we have two sagittal images of the elbow are actually coronal images and yeah. these are they're, they're in between they're neither okay um it does look like there's some mild edema in the radial tuberosity and so i'd want to evaluate the biceps attachment further okay so here's some further images okay so here again we can see similar edema throughout the proximal radius. It's not just focused to the radial tuberosity. So this makes me concerned for some type of trabecular injury. Okay. Um, not sure if I see a fracture. It looks like there may be a transverse fracture, but I can't tell. Yeah, it just looks pretty normal on the T1, but abnormal here. And uh, this is normal marrow. And this can be a problem just to be aware of here, this is oblique. There's actually some abnormality of the common extensor tendon here, which is probably a cause of the patient's symptoms. But routinely, when you do the elbow, you'll see increased signal intensity within the radial tuberosity here. And it's believed to be to do that that's a common location where you have a lot of hematopoietic marrow elements, even in older individuals. So when you suppress the fat, it can look very bright. Uh, and this is, if you start looking for this, you'll see it in, in most cases. And it's generally not a problem because you don't really think about it, uh, except when it comes in and somebody's concerned about bone injury in this location, then you've got to realize that it's very common to have high signal intensity on the fat suppressed images right in this proximal aspect of the radius. Uh, and this was a uh, normal marrow signal in this patient. I guess you have to look at the cortices. Um... Uh, real carefully, don't you, John? Well, the cortices help. 
Uh, being and the, and the other thing is, uh, this elbow probably wasn't positioned like it right. usually is. That, that, that's a problem too. It's really obliqued, and uh, it, you really have to train the techs to position them the same way each time. That's exactly right, John. Okay. And here's a patient. It's a sagittal T1, and we can see that there's increased fluid within the joint space. So this is a patient with an effusion. It's kind of similar to what you might see on plain films. On plain films, you'll see displacement of that anterior fat pad that you're all familiar with. And this is just kind of the MR correlate of that. So uh, let's talk about some congenital lesions. Uh, uh, and the medial ancaneus and the lateral, lateral plica. So, uh, Michael, what do you think of this? Okay, so that's an axial view of the elbow. We see an accessory muscle overlying the kind of like the cubital tunnel, right overlying the uh, ulnar nerve. So that'd be compatible with that medial accessory muscle. common term for it is the intraneous epitrochlearis muscle. It's believed that this can produce both by dynamic and static compression of the ulnar nerve in the cubital tunnel and produce uh, ulnar neuropathy here. So this is what the normal should look like. As you come down, you have muscles proximal and distal, but at the level of the, uh, uh, you're right in the uh, mid part of the joint space, you really shouldn't have a, a muscle back here, as you all know. So that's a uh, on the coronal images and sagittal images, it can look like this. There is the abnormal muscle here, and here it is as well, uh, which it can cause compression of the ulnar nerve. And uh, the treatment for this can be the removal of the muscle here or uh, transpose the ulnar nerve anterior to the condyle. And then here, if we go distally, this is the ulnar nerve, and we can now we're getting into the uh, flexor muscles uh, where they attach here, and that's normal anatomy distally. Uh, and the, here's another patient. So what you look for for these is you can see the uh, abnormal muscle posteriorly here and the cubital tunnel, and then you look to see if there is uh, edema within the ulnar nerve. And also, you look at the ulnar nerve proximally and distally to see if you get an hourglass appearance to the ulnar nerve. Those are findings that have been described uh, in any uh, neuropathy. How accurate they are, I, I believe that they're probably not very sensitive, nor are they very specific, those findings. Uh, we did a study in 180 uh, adults who had no, had no old, uh, elbow symptoms and we found a fairly large number of those actually had what looked like edema within the ulnar nerve, even though they were asymptomatic. So uh, it's something to look for, but it, it's not uh, a highly accurate finding. Okay. Well, a physical examination will tell you if you have the problem um, quite readily. So um, MRI helps you locate the situation in terms of um, uh, where you may need surgery, um, if that's the case. Um, but uh, the diagnosis is easily made clinically. Great, excellent. Jennifer, what do you think of this case? It has lateral elbow pain. Um, so here we can see the it looks like we're at the level of the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament, and I don't see a tear. Um, there may be some mild increased signal intensity, but I think it's intact. Okay. Uh, what do you think of this little thing right in here? Um, right on this single image, yeah, it's hard to tell what that is. I, that could be the radial yeah, collateral same, same, ligament. Same thing as seeing these. Uh, it could be a tear of the radial. No, 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 no. I think of 
something normal. Something normal. Hmm. Oh, the plica. Okay. I was trying to give you a clue. <laughs> I wasn't very good at it, I guess. It's also called the synovial fringe. And some studies suggest that it's abnormal if it's more than 2.6 millimeters in thickness. Uh, I, uh, I, you can see this fairly commonly. This is also another common finding in, in asymptomatic elbows. And quite frankly, I'm not comfortable knowing what's normal or abnormal here. So if I see it and there's any concern, I'll kind of mention it. But uh, uh, I don't know good criteria to differentiate normal from pathologic in these, and, and let's say very, very rarely you'll see marked thickening in edema, but that's a very uncommon finding. Now, is this um, have dye in it? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, I, 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 I've never removed one of these um, all it is to, is just like a little fold fold of a uh, synovial tissue that may be a little hypertrophied on in some individuals it would be nice to get a mri of the other side or um, if, if one was interested in doing a study MOB pitcher, posterior lateral elbow pain, and catching. I guess I'm trying to. Uh, What's that? Uh, I mean, is that like again the. I mean, this is almost like in the area of like the lateral. Um, you know, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Well, it's lateral. But it'd be coming the other way. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure what that is. So, so this, this patient went to surgery, and this was an acquired plica. When they removed it, all of his symptoms went away. So, so this was a, a reasonably well-documented surgical case of a symptomatic uh, lateral plica. Okay. Jennifer, what Trau is uh, the trauma? Yeah, repetitive trauma, right. Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Well, he has bilateral deformity and chronic pain. Um, so it looks like there's chronic Appearing deformity of the proximal radius and ulna fused together, and this is a, a syndrome. I cannot remember the name of it. Yeah, called radial congenital radial ulnar fusion. I think there's some other names as well. So, Synostosis. Yeah, so you can. Uh, uh, this patient had it bilaterally. Okay, so let's go on and talk about tendon and ligaments. And we're going to go from lateral, medial, biceps, and then the triceps. So uh, medial versus lateral injuries. Uh, by far the most common injuries of the elbow are lateral injuries. Uh, uh, about 85, 90, probably 95%. Uh, however, the injuries that we're generally more interested in in the athletes are medial side injuries, which typically don't occur in the non-athletic population. These middle medial in, injuries are in, uh, caused by massive valgus forces in the late cocking and early acceleration phase of the throwing. We've already talked about the throwing mechanism, and they involve the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament, flexor muscle tears, and lateral bony impaction injuries. So we're going to be looking uh, at, a, at a lot of these injuries. So if we go back to the throwing mechanism again, uh, this is the, the, the Job uh, phases. You have the wind up, uh, and then that ends when the hands come apart. You have the early cocking phase, the late cocking phase, which we've talked about before, and this is where most of the injuries occur in the elbow and the shoulder of throwing athletes. 
then the acceleration, and then the follow-through phases and the finish. So as you, you can see here in this late cocking phase, and we've already talked about how most of us can't get in this position, you have uh, distraction injuries anteriorly, uh, medially, and you have impaction injuries on, on the lateral side, uh, the so-called valgus load uh, here. And let me just, uh, we've done this before, but let me just kind of go through it again, if I can figure out how to do it here. Uh, that's not the way to do it. So here we go through the different phases, and then there's the late cocking phase, uh, and then you can see where you're abruptly going, the uh, hand is going posteriorly, and all of a sudden it stops and is whipped anteriorly, so you have a, a lot of forces in, on both the shoulder and the elbow in that location, and then you go forward very rapidly uh, with the throwing mechanism. So that, that's what most of the occur that, that we're going to talk about. So let's go and talk about uh, some of the anatomy and the structures on the lateral side. So there are a lot of lateral lateral sided pain syndromes. There's the posterior lateral plica that we've just kind of talked about, and I've seen that one good documented case. Uh, posterior lateral rotatory instability, lateral epicondylitis, uh, which is everywhere and everybody uses it, but I, again, as I've said over and over again, I don't like using this term because uh, it implies the wrong pathophysiologic mechanism. This is a tear. It's not an inflammatory condition. And you have you can get radial nerve entrapment, Panner's disease, capitular osteochondritis, discans, which are similar diseases but at different phases of the development of the young kids, and radio kappa teller overload syndromes. So if you look here, if we look at the ligaments, here you can see the the condyle, the radial head. This is the annular ligament uh, around the radial head, which actually is not one of the most important stabilizers of the elbow. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the most important stabilizer of the lateral side uh, of the uh, elbow back here. This is posteriorly. Here's the olecranon. So this is a ligament to structure that's posterior laterally here. It goes over the annular ligament here, and this is the radial collateral ligament coming down uh, from the joint space here, radiocollateral ligament, and then the common extensor tendon will be out here, external to the radiocollateral ligament. So these are the ligament structures, which we can see here. Uh, just a, a diagram showing the, the annular ligament here, uh, and then the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and uh, radiocollateral ligament, and then there's another uh, anterior lateral collateral ligament here, which is not so important. Uh, what I've been reading, uh, John, uh, most of the uh, morphology uh, in, in terms of uh, um, uh, stability is because of uh, the morphology of the elbow on the lateral side. Okay. In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's over 50%. Um, maybe closer to 90 almost, uh, it is uh, the bone and the cartilage uh, of, the, of the lateral elbow as well as the capsule. And uh, the ligaments and so on are, are not as, as um, important as uh, the way that uh, uh, bone and cartilage is constructed. Okay, thank you. For stability. Good. So here's just a case, uh, and we're into the lateral side. We can see the a little enfolding here, a little uh, plica on this side. Uh, there it is uh, with contrast. The other was without contrast. There's with the arthrogram coming in there, and this is actually the uh, part of the, the uh, radio collateral ligament as as it attaches here uh, by the joint space. So let's talk a little bit about the posterior lateral plica syndrome. Typically occurs from the age of 20 to 40 year olds, and it comes from kind of chronic twisting injuries uh, where you keep damaging those uh, capsular structures and you start getting the overgrowth as it healing the, the injuries, and that produces thickening, 
and then uh, you get a lot of nerve fibers in there and you can produce a pain syndrome uh, due to the development of that granulation tissue and, and uh, capsular thickening. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> now this is the annular ligament uh, really at the head of the uh, radial head. Now the uh, lateral ulnar collateral ligament is in the similar location. It actually originates a little bit uh, or uh, more distally on the ulna and it comes up over, this is probably part of it here, over the annular ligament and attaches then uh, uh, more, dist more distally on the, on the, on the radius. Uh, but here's the part of the annular ligament. The annular ligament attaches right here. The lateral and collateral ligament would attach up just a little bit. Okay, and that's the supernator crest where both of them attach. Here's a patient who had trauma to the elbow. What we can see here is disruption uh, of this uh, annual ligament uh, complex. Uh, this also extended mm. to the origin of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament uh, as well, uh, but this is primarily an annual collateral ligament, uh, an annual ligament injury. Um, these patients, if it's just limited to the annular ligament, uh, they can still have most stability, as John was saying, the stability that this isn't that important uh, structure for stability, but very often uh, it will involve much more than just the annular ligament, uh, in which case it uh, can become unstable. And so that's the annular ligament. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament attaches more distally on the radius, comes posterior laterally as we talked about earlier in the and attaches posteriorly here on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And this is a more important stabilizer of the lateral compartment than is the annular ligament. And when it's torn, and here we have a, a more severe example of both an annular ligament tear as well as a tear of the ulnar origin of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and this patient was very unstable, which we can see there. Okay, with the uh, uh, John, John, is it the instability or is it pain that we're talking about? Uh, in this patient, what I was told, the patient, uh, well, the patient had a lot of pain. This was a trabecular bone injury here. These were uh, strains of the uh, flexor muscle mass over here. Uh, this, what I was told. Uh, yeah. The reason I mention that is instability of the elbow from trauma is is um, uh, not uh, very common once you reduce the, 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 the dislocation. Okay. And um, in fact, uh, dislocated elbows um, only produce instability in maybe 2% of cases. Oh, okay. It's kind of interesting about this new stuff I'm reading. Interesting. I was told yes, that it was stable, but I, I, I didn't examine the patient, so that was just uh, what I heard from here. So. Yeah, yeah I, under, I understand. Uh, I mean, people that I'm examine uh, patients uh, uh, nowadays, are, it, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I see some... Uh, fluid extending inferiorly to the uh, lateral collateral ligament and I think there's a disruption proximally and it might be an avulsion actually because you could see that the bone is kind of discontinuous. I think there's an avulsion and there's bone marrow deba there. Yeah. So this is a pure avulsion. Uh, this, uh, this is the cut that showed it best, but you can see it a little bit on the one cut that was more posterior. This is really an avulsion injury of the bone at the uh, origin of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament from the uh, from the humerus back here. Federal male fall on outstretched hand, rule out ligament tear. So kind of similar, we see quite a bit of fluid extending. Uh, along the lateral aspect of the radius. So there's got to be, you know, a lateral collateral, lateral ulnar collateral ligament or radial collateral ligament What's injury. That? What is that? I believe that's a detached and kind of like retracted lateral ulnar collateral ligament. 
can see it pulled down here uh, or distally. And then there also there was an injury to the capitellum here as well in this particular patient. And here we can see the, the lateral ulna collateral ligament attached to the ulna. Here the radial component is torn and it's displaced. And I think this patient also had a, a radial collateral ligament tear as well. Uh, you can see here. And the bone injuries. And then there's uh, posterior lateral rotatory instability. Uh, so we can see here, typical injuries are avulsion injuries of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, common extensor tendon, as well as injuries to the to the uh, collateral ligament, the collateral ligaments there. So let's talk about some of this anatomy. Uh, if we look, go. Uh, uh, we already talked about the ligaments, which are the deep structures. If we now talk about the uh, not so deep structures, uh, uh, more superficial structures, we can see the uh, uh, supinator muscle here, uh, which uh, is attaches to the radius and helps in supination of the forearm. And then we have the, the common extensor tendons, of which there are three of them here. There's the extensor digitorum communis, which is the most distal one, attaching to the lateral epicondyle. There's the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is the middle one, and almost all tears of the uh, of this lateral complex start with the ECRB uh, injury, and which is commonly called epicondylitis. But what it is, it's a tear of the origin of the extensor carpi radialis brevis from the lateral epicondyle, Occasionally, maybe in 5 to 10% of cases, you'll get little avulsion injuries of the epicondyle, in which case you can have edema within the epicondyle. And then there's the extensor carpi radialis longus, uh, which are, uh, originates much more proximally here, coming down. So if we look at some of this anatomy here on this uh, stir image, here's uh, more distally, here's the extensor digitorum coming off the distal end of the uh, lateral epicondyle. There's part of the radial collateral ligament and also the uh, digitorum here coming down into the muscle. <clears throat> At this point, we can see that there's a tear of the origin of that middle uh, origin, which is really the uh, uh, ECRB right here. This is the typical location of most injuries here, which is very common in the elbow. And then if we go more vorally and more proximally, we get up to where we have the uh, origin of the of the longest, uh, which is rarely involved in in pathology in this area. So Jennifer, what do you think of this patient? It's a 39 year old male, acute pain after heavy lifting. Um, just on the coronal image, I see a lot of irregularity at the expected common extensor tendon attachment to the lateral epicondyle and on the sagittal images I don't see a tear but it's at least tendinosis moderate tendinosis and he may have some partial thickness tearing okay and there's a lot of thickening here of the fibrous tissues of the common extensor mechanism suggesting a lot of chronic disease okay uh, 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 and do we have any idea how many cortisone shots there were there? That's a good question, John. I bet it was more than one. I bet it was two. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of the axial image here? Um, so again, here we can see thickening of the common extensor tendon origin. I don't see a tear on the axial images. It's like a chronically thickened and scarred. There may be a small tear there. What do you think about this right in here? Um, okay, muscle strain. Yeah, so this, this is a patient who had chronic long-standing lateral elbow pain uh, called lateral epicondylitis and then had an acute injury. And this signal that we see here and the signal we see here is actually some edema within the the muscle near the musculotendinous attachment, and this was a muscle strain. Acute on top of chronic. And there's what people call lateral epicondylitis. We've talked a lot about. Uh, let's see. Ashley, what do you think of this case? Uh, 
Uh, 54 year old female, Sunni, elbow pain for one month, injection of steroid hypothyr hypothyroidism. So uh, on the radiographs, we can see uh, ossification near the lateral epicondyle. It's irregular. Um, I don't, on the lateral, I don't really see much there, but, um, I, you know, this is, looks like, oh, okay, so this is hydroxyapatite deposition. Okay, so um, on the stir images, we can see increased signal at the attached end of the common extensor origin. Um, so it looks like, you know, it's tendinosis, but probably a partial tear as well. So, again, uh, uh, tendinosis is probably chronic partial or repeated or chronic partial tears from repeated injury, and then you get a healing response. So it's it's a combination of uh, interstitial partial tears and granulation tissues all, all kind of together due to the chronic repetitive nature of the injury. Uh, uh, partial tears themselves uh, would like to include is primarily more acute lesions where you have uh, a tear with fluid collecting within within the tendon. But in reality, the two are, are very difficult to separate. And as has been shown in most good studies, wherever this has been able to be studied, which is best in the rotator cuff of the shoulder, you basically don't get tears of tendons unless you have underlying tendinosis and degenerative disease. So uh, the, the, the two are probably just different degree, uh, degrees of the same pathologic process, uh, in, in most adults anyway. Uh, so that would be kind of severe tendinosis. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Again, these are all lateral elbow pain. Um, so again, here I see some severe tendinosis at the common extensor tendon origin and there it does look like there's some high grade partial thickness tearing um, but there's still some fibers remaining intact yeah and a lot of irregularity of the bone here as well that's not the normal bony anatomy and there's a lot of edema here and some loss of the of the lateral epicondyle even some of the subchondral bone has been lost here uh, would you think that there is a lot of granulation tissue there? Yes, I'm sure that's... Because when I used to operate on these, uh, I didn't operate on that many because there's, you just don't do that. Um, I always found a lot of granulation tissue in these areas, yeah. either due to trauma or due to injections. Yeah. And, and now they, the, what they do is, uh, can, can I mention... Uh, uh, the treatment a little bit. Yes. Uh, uh, what they do now, they inject hyaluronine. Uh, it seems to be more effective than cortisone uh, and uh, less of a problem with uh, what cortisone does. Yes. So that, I found that interesting. I, I've always been a cortisone guy. Yeah, so it's, so this is a more chronic changes, a lot of chronic uh, uh, avulsive injury here with granulation tissue, as John said, a lot of thickening, uh, tendinosis, and some erosive changes of the bone, probably from chronic traction injury uh, to the lateral epicondyle. Uh, just like to also talk a little bit about treatment here, uh, but this is a very anecdotal case. Uh, I've had lateral epicondylitis, or the clinical syndrome of lateral epicondylitis, twice. Uh, both from overuse. The second time really lasted for about six months. And <clears throat> it continued until one day I was rollerblading with my daughter when she was younger, and I fell on the beach in Santa Barbara, and I developed a, a, a non-displaced fracture of my wrist. And so I'd had terrible elbow pain for about six to eight months at that time. They put my wrist in a splint for the, for the uh, fracture, and within two weeks, the elbow pain went away, and I haven't gotten it since. Uh, the thing to remember the, Swede, the Swedes use um, a splint for the wrist uh, to treat this condition. Yeah, and, and I just want to point out, remember, this condition is caused by uh, traction of the uh, 
lateral mass from its attachment on the lateral epicondyle. And that, that you typically get that by, by grip. When you have a grip, you have to stabilize the wrist by, and you have to uh, contract both the flexor and extensor muscle masses, and then also by extending the wrist in the extended position. By putting it in a splint and keeping me from using it on everyday activities, I think it allowed the, the tendon to heal. So uh, yeah, yeah, it kind of surprised me at that time, but in, in retrospect, thinking about the mechanism of the injury, it makes perfect sense. I, I, I used to treat this at, uh, with an extensor splint at night. Uh-huh, yep. And uh, yep. during the day, people don't like to wear splints and, right. uh, for various reasons. Yeah. And uh, it works pretty well. You can't function well. Uh, well. Right. And, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, who's next? Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. Call trouble player with elbow dislocation. Um, okay, so I want to see some fluid kind of adjacent to the ulna, like kind of where the you would expect the UCL to be. Looks like there's probably a defect there, so I'm worried about an ulnar collateral ligament tear. And then looking on the radial side, I think it's okay. Um, that I wonder if that's a defect right there of the radial collateral ligament as well. So to tear both. So most of the time, <clears throat> these are chronic lesions, but this is one case where the patient was a young person. He had a a, a, a dislocation, and this is an acute tear of the communis tendon here. This is the ECRB and it's intact. This is a rare case where we have a tear really of the communis, which is probably more acute in, in this particular setting. Uh, and the radial collateral ligament also torn? The radial collateral ligament is also torn, right. Okay, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Again, all lateral elbow pain. Um, so again here, I see some thickening of the common extensor tendon origin, and it looks like there's some partial thickness tearing of the superficial fibers or the extensor carpi radialis brevis fibers and adjacent soft tissue edema. Yeah, and then we can see a focal fluid collection here right at the origin of the ECRB. This is the typical finding that you'll see in partial tears of the ECRB origin, of the coming sense origin. There's the, the axial images showing the very typical appearance and, quote, lateral epicondylitis. Okay. And then if we go to the sagittal images, we can actually see the anatomy here also. That's the longus up there. Here is the ECRB, which is this part of the tendon coming right through there. This is the tear in the ECRB, and then here's the uh, digitorum communis coming down here. So this is the typical location on the sagittal images where you'll see these uh, partial tears of the ECRB, which are, uh, uh, in my experience, the most common cause of elbow pain in the general population. Oh, uh, this was a study, we were talking about treatment. Uh, this was a study that looked at different treatments uh, <clears throat> and compared uh, doing tenotomies with needles just to go in and, and irritate the area. Uh, and then they, they followed them over time. Uh, but And they found that if you go in and basically needle it, uh, you'll get more vascularization uh, <clears throat> than if you just put lidocaine in alone. So they were saying that if you go in and put in uh, steroids, or in this case, they use PRP and lidocaine, uh, that if you actually disrupt the fibers mechanically, in addition to putting that PRP in, uh, that uh, you, you get uh, increased thickness and uh, more vascularization by ultrasound in the healing phase. But they found that there were really no changes in functionality or pain over time, 20 months. Now, let's talk a little bit about PRP here. Uh, uh, John? Yes. A, a lot depends on what the 
the patient does um, after the treatment. Yeah, right. Um, and, and that's a, and that's the kicker. Um, uh, I've had enough cases in my life that um, if a patient doesn't, um, uh, if the patient continues to do the same thing that causes the problem in a in the beginning, uh, no matter what kind of treatment you use, they're going to continue having problems. Yeah, I really, I, that, I really believe that. I think that's a very important uh, concept because a lot of these people who come in and want aggressive therapy, they want the aggressive ther therapy it's because they think they can get rid of the pain but continue their activities. And uh, it, uh, I, I, I always used to, if, if I injected them with erisospan, which was my favorite um, cortisone preparation, because it lasts a lot a longer than the others. Um, and I, I always told them and, uh, and I put them in a splint and I said, um, stop doing what you're doing that it caused it. And uh, uh, most of these, I've probably seen more housewives with the problem than I have with uh, uh, other uh, conditions, uh -huh. uh, other than sports, of course. Uh, that's that's, that's a, probably a different situation entirely yeah uh so so prp so the, the the literature on prp uh when you review it all the papers are very small they only have a few patients as far as i know i don't know of a single placebo controlled study in the literature for prp and most prp also they don't really have good control about what they to see if what they inject actually is uh has increased uh, platelets within within the component, and and uh, uh, I know that there are some studies where they've gone back and they've actually looked and they found that whatever device they had didn't really enhance the platelets to the degree that it was stated. Uh, we're currently involved in a project at Cedars where we're we're looking at this in a very highly controlled manner. Uh, the studies haven't started yet; they're supposed to really start doing patients in January. Uh, we're going to very uh, closely characterize the, the cellular components, not only the PRP, but uh, we have about 60 different markers for the other cells that are involved to find out exactly which cells are being injected and follow uh, patients over time. And I think we're also going to have a group that will have MRs with these. Uh, <clears throat> there are one of the first papers that claimed that PRP was successful was in treating this particular condition. But if you go back and look at papers, there are a lot of papers that showed no effect for uh, uh, lateral epicondylitis as well. John? Uh, you can also inject uh, blood, or you can spin down the blood and inject the, um, whatever's left. But, but, it, 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 all kinds of stuff has been tried, but nothing that I know, know of that has become um, a detrit the best treatment or whatever that may be the 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 prp is the component of the blood if you uh prp means platelet rich plasma so if you enrich the plasma to have the the uh uh in a centrifuge that component that is has most of the platelet is thought to have most of the cytokines that are important for the healing uh, of, of tissues and that's the thought behind it it's interesting that a lot of physicians, if you talk to them, they talk about putting PRP in for its anti-inflammatory effects. There are even papers that say that. But in reality, what PRP does, if it functions, it's the opposite. It's, it's supposed to induce an inflammatory response and therefore the secondary healing response. And therefore, uh, some people believe that for the times when it's really effective, first it increases the pain because it increases the inflammatory reaction and the body's response to then induce healing. So you get a flare up and then it gets better as you go through the healing phase. But uh, I think it's fair to, well, a couple of things right now is that uh, as far as I know, still no insurance companies pay for it because it's generally considered that there is no good scientific evidence to support it. Therefore, most of these patients pay out of pocket. Uh, many people are not interested in doing uh, quality studies because they don't want it to become 
uh, approved and paid for by insurance because a lot of these patients are willing to pay a lot more for this technique than insurance companies would be willing to pay. So as, as far as I'm concerned, and those people who really push it, it's more of a revenue generator than a proven treatment technique. Uh, uh, John, uh, my, my iPad, for some reason, um, apparently it wasn't um, plugged in quite well. Uh, and I'm reading a 10% battery remaining. Okay, uh, we don't have too much longer to go. Can you plug it in? Uh, um, I, I certainly can, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Okay, good. All right. There's a lot of variety with PRP. Now they have leukocyte-rich PRP, leukocyte-poor PRP, PPP, like poor plasma. Yeah. And it depends upon which company's device you purchase. And so uh, one of the reasons why... Uh, this group at Cedars is really looking carefully. It's that they're testing a lot of these, and they're they're doing very sophisticated tests to determine uh, what cells are actually involved and what non-cellular elements are involved. So hopefully we'll get some more information with better quality studies going forward. Uh, let's see who did the last one? Um. Looks like there is a tear of the um, on the extensor tendon here, um, uh, more distally, so and a radial collateral ligament tear. Yeah, so this involves the uh, the CRB, the communis radial collateral ligament, which is a more extensive injury uh, than it usually starts. So we start with CRB and then extend across from what we're seeing here. Hey, uh, John, John, could you uh, could you mute your device when you're doing that? I, I just plugged it in. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So see increased signal with the Within the extensor, common tendon, especially, and as well as like edema surrounding it, uh, the bone itself and the attachment looks normal. I don't know if this is kind of like a, almost looks like a delaminated tear with kind of retracted tendon down distally. Yeah, right there. So, so this is actually a full thickness tear of the ECRB with, with distal retraction of the ECRB in this particular patient. Again, uh, most of these are still treated conservatively. But uh, there are people who will uh, operate on some of these if you have displaced tendons. So, I don't know about the radial collateral ligament, but this injury does extend into the communis. And I think there's a partial to the communis. I don't com comment too much on the radial collateral ligaments because it's really not an important element. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? So this patient presented with an elbow dislocation, and it looks like there is a tear of the common extensor origin, and there may be an ossific avulsion fragment uh, there, kind of at the retracted tendon. Yeah, so this is a retracted communis tendon down here. And, uh, uh, like here from uh, France felt that if you went far enough back, this is a radial collateral ligament tear, but also a tear of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And you can see that the go along with that is you've got increased space laterally here. So this shows that you have instability laterally because you have tightening of the lateral joint space. And that that is uh, highly suggested that you've got a lateral ulnar collateral ligament tear because it's the lateral ulnar collateral ligament that actually maintains the distance between the uh, capitellum and the radius. And there's further tearing. Okay. Okay, I think there's a uh, so 21-year-old uh, college football player with elbow dislocation. Along the lateral aspect of the elbow, you see a tear of the sensor tendon. There, probably ECRB. 
and there's I think there's also a tear of the uh, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Yeah. Of the bone? No, I think I don't know. So we had a lot of a lot of tears. And here we can see another injury. Uh, this is another chronic, very irregular type injury. Uh, tear of the uh, common extensor tendon here with a lot of edema uh, surrounding the common extensor tear. All train vehicle accident. First thing is this kind of diffuse edema surrounding the entire elbow joint in like interior compartment. Um, so uh, laterally, I mean, there's a lot of edema surrounding that radial head. And I think the annular ligament is probably torn. And, uh, what about the bones? Um, they're not really, well, one, the radius is not articulating with the capitellum anymore, so it's dislocated. Yeah. Yeah. John, could you uh, mute your device? Okay. And so here we can see uh, uh, this is a, an elbow dislocation scanned in the scanner. Okay, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here we have a 12-year-old male, so we should have all the ossification centers. And here it looks like there's an avulsion fracture of the lateral epicondyle at the attachment of the common extensor tendon okay. and a joint effusion. Okay, so here, here's actually a bony avulsion not uh, the common type injury. And we're actually getting very posteriorly here. Uh, this is probably the lateral older collateral ligament coming up here. Uh, we're probably a little bit posterior to the main in, uh, origin of the common extensor tendon. And this is a bony avulsion of the lateral older collateral ligament. Okay. Um. So we have a coronal and axial. I think this looks like there's been surgical correction of a previous tear of the common extensor tendon. I think they try to suture it in. There's a lot of thickening there. John, are you still with us? You muted. It says he's, says he's muted, but then on the other hand here, it says he's not muted. Okay. Right there. Oh, no. I clicked on it. And it says uh, it's, um, it's not muted. Okay. I can't hear John. Okay. okay. So here, here, this is a surgical case where we can see the metal artifact from surgery uh, to reattach a torn uh, extensor carpal tunnel tendon. And then uh, here, here is a case of someone who has chronic instability of the elbow, and this is a chronic long-standing disease. The patient's had prior surgery and the surgical constructs have, have broken down here uh, with ruptures. Is there disruption of the capitalum as well? Like the elbow it almost looks like the this, this is surgery. This That's is post-operative. Uh, actually, why don't, we, why don't we stop here, and we'll, we'll pick up uh, elbow injuries tomorrow. OK? Any questions? OK. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, John. 
what happened?